Welcome to the Conversations That Matter podcast. My name is John Harris. We take a break today from our regularly scheduled programming to talk about a novel that I'm very fond of. It's uh, actually my favorite Christmas uh, story at this point. It's called Old Christmas by Washington Irving. Originally, it was published in 1819, 1820, that time period, as five separate short stories. And there were sketches that accompanied them. And Washington Irving, for those who don't know, is probably one of the most famous uh, American writers uh, and certainly a pioneer uh, because uh, of, of how early on he gained acclaim in Europe uh, when American writers didn't have that acclaim yet. But he wrote uh, stories such as The Legend of Sleepy Hollow and Rip Van Winkle. And I think he's near and dear to my heart in part because I spent so much time in upstate New York. And in fact, right now, as I'm uh, re- going to read portions of this to you, I'm sitting in upstate New York, and it's beautiful. Uh, it's a wonderful time of year to be here, in my opinion, though p- the political situation isn't great right now. Uh, there's still a-, a history that's very unique that um, honestly is understudied in my mind, especially the Dutch history, uh, which Washington Irving is, of course, credited with bringing into legend, uh, the Dutch history of New York. They- there's a unique uh, history to the Hudson River Valley that predates the arrival of the Puritans and uh, there, there was a Dutch influence that permeated the area. There's still hints of it here and there, especially in the Catskill Mountains. And, and Washington Irving captures some of that for me. And in this book though, he's not talking about upstate New York, he's talking about uh, England. And he's, he's looking back to a time in which Christmas wasn't so characterized by the hustle and bustle, modernity, temporariness. It was something that was more meaningful and deeper, and relationships were warmer towards uh, one another across uh, class distinctions, and families seem to be closer, and and he longs for this kind of thing. And it's interesting because you, you pick up similar themes, romanticized Christmas themes in Hallmark movies. And I talked about that a few weeks ago, but even at an early date, such as 1819, you have Washington Irving looking back and saying, I think we've already, we're we're, we're missing something already. There's something left out. There's something that we would long to go back to as it pertains to Christmas. And and that's something that I think uh, is worth talking about. And I think mankind, uh, we often have this. Uh, in fact, uh, there's, I can't remember the, the reference. There's a, there's a proverb, or I believe it's in the book of Ecclesiastes, where there's a, a passage about this, looking back and longing for the time of the fathers. And, you know, kind of actually, I think there's a warning not to do that, not to think that, uh, not to look at the past with rose-colored glasses, uh, because uh, every time is different. There's good blessings about today that we often take for granted that would not have been present years ago. But at the same time, there's also things, this is why C.S. Lewis talked about reading old books in part, uh, and the importance of it. There's also things that we've left behind. There's things that could uh, shine a light on the uh, issues and uh, just the things that are lacking in our own day when we look to the past and see the richness uh, that used to exist in pre-modern cultures especially. And that's really what you have here is Washington Irving is on the cusp of modernity. He's looking back at a pre-modern time and longing for some of the good things, the true and valuable things. We wouldn't say that everything in, in a pre-modern time is wor- worthy of conservation, but there certainly were a lot of good things that we've left behind and in some ways we're longing for them. And, and, and of course, uh, today, in really almost all modern uh, tales of the times of knights and maidens and pre-modern times, there, there's often a, a theme, uh, more often than not, about how oppressive these times were, that uh, the divine right of kings is a horrible thing, that marrying uh, because of, for the sake of political alliances or an arranged marriage is a horrible, oppressive thing. Of course, uh, subjugation, uh, slavery, uh, serfdom, all horrible things, the labor relationships that existed at that time, the way women uh, did not have a public voice like they do today, horrible things. And so the past is very much, uh, it's demonized in almost every modern uh, 
uh, Ren. In fact, there was just a movie that came out not too long ago that I, I'm not going to watch it, but it's about knights. And it's this epic film, but no one wanted to watch it because it uh, uses those themes to such an extreme. It just it shows the, the horrible barbaric times and uh, the, women didn't have uh, any place in society. And so there's a sense in which those times should be so condemned. Well, Washington Irving saw there was actually some, not just useful, but there were some meaningful things about uh, a time in England's past in which Christmas was celebrated in a way that it wasn't celebrated in his own time. Uh, or at least there was a heightened uh, exhilaration. And, and I think that's, that's something that's worthy of study, that's worthy of looking back on. And, and of course, this is a uh, short stories compiled into a book, so this isn't first-hand experience, but it it gives you a window into 1819 and what and why this was popular, what people thought at that time, what they thought of uh, as far as being what, what the ideal Christmas was, and it also gives you a window into the 1700s, perhaps, and, and the time before when Christmas in the countryside of England was perhaps celebrated in a different way, of which people had fond memories. Uh, in, into the uh, future. And so this is, this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to read excerpts from Old Christmas. And so I have the Kindle version here. You can get this on hard co copy. You can get this on Kindle. But uh, And by the way, I have my Conversations That Matter mug, which uh, I'm really, really happy about this. Um, this is actually like, this is my new favorite mug. It's actually engraved on the bottom too. Susan Lane 2021. She's the one that made this. Susan Lane. Um, and I believe she has an Etsy shop, Susan Lane in uh, Tennessee, in uh, Knoxville area, Tennessee. And uh, anyway, excellent, excellent uh, mugs. So as I'm drinking my tea and uh, getting ready for Christmas, I want to share with you something that has really just blessed me. And uh, it's, uh, again, it, it, this isn't the, the Christmas story, the biblical Christmas story, but this is one of the... The, the extra things, one of the things that accompany this season, accompany this particular holiday that uh, has just made it a richer experience for me. And I love uh, listening to it on audiobook every year. I've done that for, I don't know now, four years or so. So let's uh, begin Old Christmas from Sketchbook of Washington Irving, 1876. There's little extra things in here. There's uh, For those watching, there's pictures. This is the preface. Before the remembrance of the good old times, so fast passing, should have entirely passed away, the present artist, R. Caldecott, and engraver James D. Cooper, plant to illustrate Washington Irving's old Christmas in this manner. Their primary idea was to carry out the principle of the sketchbook by incorporating the design with the text. Throughout, they have worked together and con amore, with what success the public must decide. And of course, here are the five essays. And I, I'm sure we won't get through all of these, but let me at least start and read for you some of them. A man might then behold at Christmas in each hall good fires to curb the cold, and meet for great and small, the neighbors were friendly bidden, and all had welcome true the poor from the gates were not children when this old cap was new. You have a picture here of people who are more poor being welcomed in to the chamber, uh, the, the house of the, the Lord, the, the nobility. And this is something that Christmas represented to them when these, these relationships between various people groups was tight and those bonds were reinforced, but in a good way, uh, where there's charity, and and this is the the thing that Washington Irving is looking back on, and he's missing some of this, uh, the the social bonds that existed at one time, and of course, I, there's as we get into this, it reminds me in some ways of the um, j just the imagery of the marriage supper of the Lamb, and how how God invites us into his palace and we don't deserve it and yet there's this bond that we have with him because of his generosity and his grace and his mercy and we see that parallel that that was uh that was an archetype christmas 
There is nothing in England that exercises a more delightful spell over my imagination than the lingerings of the holiday customs and rural games of former times. They recall the pictures my fancy used to draw in the May morning of life, when as yet I only knew the world through books and believed it to be all that poets had painted it. And they bring with them the flavor of those honest days of yore, in which perhaps with equal fallacy I am apt to think the world was more homebred, social and joyous than at present. I regret to say that they uh, are daily growing more and more faint, being gradually worn away by time, but still more obliterated by modern fashion. They resemble those picturesque morsels of Gothic architecture which we see crumbling in various parts of the country, partly dilapidated by the waste of ages and partly lost in the additions and alterations of latter days. Poetry, however, clings with cherishing fondness about the rural games and holiday revel from which it has derived so many of its themes as the ivy wins its rich foliage about the Gothic arch and moldering tower, gratefully repaying their support by clasping together their tottering remains and, if, as it were, embalming them in verdure. Of all the old festivals, however, that of Christmas awakens the strongest and most heartfelt associations. There is a tone of solemn and sacred feeling that blends with our conviviality and lifts the spirit to a state of hollowed and elevated enjoyment. The services of the church about this season are extremely tender and inspiring. They dwell on the beautiful story of the origin of our faith and the pastoral scenes that accompanied its announcement. They gradually increase in fervor and pathos during the season of Advent until they break forth in full jubilee on the morning that brought peace and goodwill to men. I do not know a grander effect of music on the moral feelings than to hear the full choir and the pealing organ performing a Christmas anthem in a cathedral and filling every part of the vast pile with triumphant harmony. It is so beautiful arrangement, also derived from days of yore, that this festival, which commemorates the announcement of the religion of peace and love, has been made the season of gathering together of family connections and drawing closer again those bands of kindred hearts which the cares and pleasures soaring to cast loose of, and it's cut off a little bit uh, in this particular, I'm not sure, uh, I think it's of care, have launched forth in life and wandered widely asunder once more to assemble about the paternal hearth, that rallying place of the affections, there to grow young and loving again among endearing memora <laughs> memen mementos, there we go, of childhood. There is something in this very season of the year that gives a charm to the festivity of Christmas. At other times, we derive a great portion of our pleasures from the mere beauties of nature. Our feelings sally forth and dissipate themselves over the sunny landscape, and we live abroad and everywhere. The song of the bird, the murmur of the stream, the breathing fragrance of spring, the soft voluptuous of summer, the golden pomp of autumn, earth with its mantle of refreshing green, and heaven with its deep, delicious blue and its cloudy magnificence, all fill us with mute but exquisite delight, and we revel in the luxury of mere sensation. But in the depth of winter, when nature lies despoiled of every charm and wrapped in her shroud of sheeted snow, we turn our gratifications to moral sources. The dreariness and desolation of the landscape, the short gloomy days and darksome nights, while they circumscribe our wanderings, shut in our feelings also from rambling abroad and make us more keenly disposed for the pleasures of the social circle. Our thoughts are more concentrated, our friendly sympathies more aroused, we feel more sensibly the charm of each other's society and are brought more closely together by dependence on each other for enjoyment. Heart calleth unto heart, and we draw our pleasure from the deep wells of living kindness which lie in the quiet recesses of our bosoms, and which, when resorted to, furnish forth the pure elements of domestic felicity. The pitchy gloom without uh, makes the heart dilate on entertaining the room filled with the glow and warmth of the evening fire. The ruddy blaze diffuses an artificial summer and sunshine through the room and lights up each countenance into the ki kindlier welcome or kindlier welcome. Where does the honest face of hospitality expand into a broader and more cordial smile? Where is the shy glance of love more sweetly eloquent that than by the winter fireside? And as the hollow blast of wintry wind rushes through the hall, clasps the distant doors, whistles about the casement, and rumbles down the chimney, what can be more grateful than that feeling of sober and sheltered security with which we look around upon the comfortable chamber and the scene of domestic hilarity? 
the English, from the great prevalence of rural habits throughout every class of society, have always been fond of those festivals and holidays which agreeably interrupt the silliness of country life. And they were, in former days, particularly observant of the religious and social rites of Christmas. It is inspiring to read the dry details which some antiquarians have given of quaint humors, the burlesque pageants, the complete abandonment to mirth and good fellowship with which this festival was celebrated. It seemed to throw open every door and unlock every heart. It brought the peasant and the peer together and blended all ranks in one warm, generous flow of joy and kindness. The old halls of castles and manor houses resounded with the harp and the Christmas carol, and their ample boards groaned under the weight of hospitality. Even the poorest cottage welcomed the festive season with great decorations of bay and holly and cheerful fire glanced its rays through the lattice, inviting the passenger to raise the latch and join the gossip knot huddled round the earth, the hearth beguiling the long evening with legendary jokes and oft-told Christmas tales. One of the least pleasing effects of modern refinement is the havoc it has made upon the hearty old holiday customs. It has completely taken off the sharp touching and spirited reliefs of these embellishments of life and has worn down society into a more smooth and polished but certainly a less characteristic surface. Many of the games and ceremonials of Christmas have entirely disappeared and like the sheriff's sher sack of old Falstaff are become matters of speculation and dispute among commentators. They flourish in times full of spirit and lustyhood when men enjoy life roughly but heartily and vigorously. Times wild and picturesque which have furnished poetry with its richest materials and the drama with its most attractive variety of characters and manners, the world has become more worldly. There is more dissipation and less of enjoyment. Pleasure has expanded into a broader but a shallower stream and has forsaken many of those deep and quiet channels where it flowed sweetly through the calm bosom of domestic life. Society has acquired a more enlightened and elegant tone, but it has lost many of its strong local peculiar peculiarities its homebred feelings, its honest fireside delights, the traditionary customs of golden-hearted antiquity, its feudal hospitalities and lordly wassailings have passed away with the bar baronial castles and stately manor houses in which they were celebrated. They comported with the shadowy hall, the great oaken gallery, and the tapestried parlor, but are unified to the light, sh showy saloons and gay drawing rooms of the modern villa. Shorn, however, as it is, of its ancient and festive honors, Christmas is still a period of delightful excitement in England. It is gratifying to see that home feeling completely aroused, which seems to hold so powerful a place in every English bosom. The preparations making on every side for the social board that is again to unite friends and kindred, the presence of good cheer, passing and repassing those tokens of regard and quickeners of kind feelings, the evergreens distributed about houses and churches, emblems of peace and gladness, all these have the most pleasing effect in producing fond association and kindling benevolent sympathies. Even the sound of the waits, rude as may be, their minstrelly, minst minstrelsy, there we go, breaks upon the mid-watches of a winter night with the effect of perfect harmony. As I have been awakened by them in that still and solemn hour when deep sleep falleth upon man, I have listened with a hushed delight, and connecting them with the sacred and joyous occasion have almost fancied them into another celestial choir, announcing peace and goodwill to mankind. How delightfully the imagination, when wrought upon these moral influences, turns everything to melody and beauty. The very crowing of the cock, who is sometimes heard in the profound repose of the country, telling the night watches to, with, um, to his feathery, feathery, there we go, feathery dames, was thought by the common people to uh, announce the approach of this sacred festival. Some say that ever gainst that season comes wherein our Savior's birth is celebrated, this bird of dawning singeth all night long, and then they say no spirit dares stir abroad, the nights are wholesome. Then no planet strike, no fairy takes, no witch hath power to charm. So hallowed and so gracious is the time. Which is the lyrics to the song that is depicted here. Uh, that He's talking about these minstrels who would play. It's caroling, that's what he's talking about. Amidst the general call to happiness, the bustle of the spirits, the stir of the affections which prevail at this period, what bosom can remain insensible? It is indeed the season of regenerate 
re regenerated feeling, the season for kindling, not merely the fire of hospitality in the hall, but the genial flame of charity in the heart, the scene of early love again rises green to memory beyond the sterile waste of years, and the idea of home fraught with the fragrance of home-dwelling joys reanimates the drooping spirit, as the Arabian breeze will sometimes waft the freshness of the distant fields to the weary pilgrim of the desert. Stranger and sojourner as I am in the land, though for me no social hearth may blaze, no hospital roof throw open its doors, nor the warm grasp of friendship welcome me at the threshold, yet I feel the influence of the season becoming into my soul from the happy looks of those around me. Surely happiness is reflective, like the light of heaven, and every countenance bright with smiles and glowing with innocent enjoyment is a mirror transmitting to others the rays of a supreme and ever-shining benevolence. He who can turn churlishly away from contemplating the felicity of his fellow beings and sit down dark, darkling and repining in his loneliness when all around is joyful may have his moments of strong excitement and selfish gratification, but he wants the genial and social sympathies which constitute the charm of a merry Christmas. So this is the first ep um, uh, part one, and there's five of these essays. And uh, as, as we can see, just in, in that, th this is not the story, this is more of the, the, the introduction, the need for the story that you're about to read. In the story, he uh, it, it starts with this essay, The Stagecoach. He ends up taking part in one of these old country English Christmases. And he gets to see firsthand. He, t he brings you into the thresholds. He shows you what the people were saying and what... Um, expressions illuminated their faces and everything associated with that whole time he he gives you a window into it, it to the point and, and this is really good literature that you feel like you're there that you're participating in all of it but a lot of what he writes about and what he illustrates is is there in that first uh, essay that i just read to you and i find it fascinating it's it's about tradition it's about family it's about rural customs it's about all these things that he longs for, like someone in the desert, but they've been lost. Where, where did they go? How come in this modern world, we, he says it's, it's, it's really more sensual. There's more, um, there, there, there's more immorality and there's, more, uh, there, there's kind of more gaudiness and more flashing of money and things like that. But there, there's something that's been lost in all of that. The true joyment, the true excitement isn't to be found in the materialism and in um, the, the sensual things that were taking place. It's to be found in something that predated uh, his time and, and still existed perhaps in rural areas where modernity had not quite made it yet. And he talks about how everyone is participating. They all feel as they're, they're one unit. They're all together enjoying Christmas. And how are they doing it? In an orderly manner. And it's directed by the elites in their society. It, it, it comes from the church. And that would have been the Church of England at that time. In fact, I was reading something recently, a few weeks ago, uh, by a historian that I thought was absolutely fascinating about the United States. And how, you know, the point he was trying to make was that in the North, um, and this is obviously, there's exceptions to this, but in the North, by and large, most churches, no matter what denomination, were influenced, especially in the Northeast, really. But in the Northeast, they were influenced by a sort of puritanical uh, kind of ideal. And that permeated the, the, the churches, and that irrespective of denomination. And, and of course, the Puritans, right, in England, they canceled Christmas. They didn't celebrate Christmas. In fact, uh, even here in the United States, that was not uh, something that uh, was celebrated uh, among the early Puritans, uh, at least not not in the, the way that um, it would have been celebrated in, in what Washington Irving's writing about, this old Christmas. Uh, in the South, though, their Anglicanism um, was the, no matter what denomination you were in, there was kind of a spirit of Anglicanism. And, and I don't know everything that it would accompany both, but I know in general, this author was trying to make the point in Puritanism, there is this m more of an attempt to uh, kind of for for pu for purity, as the name would apply. But there there's a a, a trying to take um, a, an ideal and then impose it, right, and force everyone into something. Whereas in um, he was saying basically broadly speaking in Anglicanism. There's more of a retaining, there's more of a mechanism for retaining tradition. 
and for incorporating that also into the church life and uh, it, it, a little more organic and not not the impositions uh, that the Puritans would have had on the general society. Anglicanism was a little more narrow, seeing as you know we we don't our our uh, our realm our our narrow channel in which we run is the church is the ecclesiastical realm and. Uh, the rest of society, uh, you know, people apply principles, but it tradition kind of is, is the river that makes things flow, and and we're also part of that. There, so it's it's hard for me to describe in such a short period of time. But this author is making, a, in my opinion, a brilliant point because I've seen this to some extent, and I think Washington Irving is looking back to this this orderly Anglican uh, this. Uh, kind of, there's formality involved in this, but at the same time, it's it's a social ritual that doesn't, it, it, it's not um, suppressing all the other things, the conviviality, the games, the all, all the things that would have been enjoyed during the Christmas season, the hilarity, he says, uh, that existed in the manors and the halls. And so there was a place for for religion, for and, and this was it was something that everyone came together, and it was so special. And, it, and without it, you wouldn't have the Christmas season. But there was also a place for all these other things, and so it wasn't reduced down to one thing. It was Christmas incorporated so many things. He talks about all the different elements, the weather, and the things that the, the fires that would you know, have to be burned because of the weather, and how that would even create this sense of uh, Christmas be, that we associate with it because of the glow on people's faces, and. So the weather, the uh, the food, the games, the traditions, the habits, the re the religion, the all of that, every single part of that, the the way that it was expected that the lords and the elites in the society would open up their halls and host everyone from the surrounding area, even if they did not have the means by which to pay for the kind of meal that they were partaking in. Uh, th this this kind of generosity, which was not enforced, but it was expected in a habit, in a custom. These all were associated with Christmas. And he says this these social bonds, this social arrangement, there was something special about it, and we've kind of we've lost it, and it, or or it's growing dimmer, as as uh, I should probably say. So let's uh, let's skip ahead. Let me uh, read for you another essay. We're gonna skip this. I love the stage. I love all of them. I love the stagecoach. Uh, essay here, but um, but I, I think what I want to do is, is because he, he gets on a stagecoach, he, he records everything that led to him being invited into uh, a, a Christmas celebration, and then he gets into what happens during Christmas, and so he talks about Christmas Eve, and uh, and, and I, I love this essay too, we're going to skip through that though as well, and just the anticipation that existed and uh, the the manor hall and 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 how it, the different characters that would have been there and the animals even and just the way people dressed and the dancing um, I often wish we could go back to some of the old dancing that uh, you know weddings today it's it's like a it's a beat it's just a beat and you just kind of it's very individualistic I and I, I don't know how to dance like a ballroom dance setting but it, it seemed to me like it was superior in some ways and that guys and girls kind of knew what was expected there wasn't awkwardness there and it was just so orderly um, I, I like that but uh, Christmas Day let's talk about this let's read this Christmas Day it starts off with a poem dark and dull night fly hence away and give the honor to this day that sees December turn to May why does the chilling winter's morn smile like a field beset with corn or smell like to a mead new shorn thus on the sudden come and see the cause why things thus fragrant be Christmas Day when I awoke in the morning it seemed as if all the events of the preceding evening had been a dream and nothing but the identity of the ancient chamber convinced me of their reality. While I lay musing on my pillow, I heard the sound of little feet pattering outside of the door and a whispering consultation. Presently, a choir of small voices chanted forth an old Christmas carol, the burden of which was, Rejoice, our Savior, he was born on Christmas Day in the morning. I rose softly, sipped 
on my, slipped on my clothes, opened the door suddenly, and beheld one of the most beautiful little fairy groups that a painter could imagine. It consisted of a boy and two girls, the eldest not more than six, and lovely as seraphs. They were going the rounds of the house and singing at every chamber door, but my sudden appearance frightened them into mute bashfulness. They remained for a moment, playing on their lips with their fingers and now, and then stealing a shy glance from under their eyebrows, until, as if by one impulse, they scampered away, and as they turned, an angel of the gallery, I heard them laughing in triumph at their escape. Everything conspired to produce kind and happy feelings in this stronghold of old-fashioned hospitality. The window of my chamber looked out upon what is in summer would have been a beautiful landscape. There was a sloping lawn, a fine stream winding at the foot of it, an attractive park beyond with noble clumps of trees and herds of deer. At a distance was a neat hamlet with the smoke of the cottage chimneys, hanging over it in a church with its dark spire in strong relief against the clear cold sky. The house was surrounded with evergreens, according to the English custom, which would have given almost an appearance of summer, but the morning was extremely frosty. The light vapor of the preceding evening had been precipitated by the cold and covered all the trees and every blade of grass with its fine crystallizations. The rays of a bright morning sun had a dazzling effect upon the glittering foliage. A robin perched upon the top of a mountain ash that hung its clusters of red berries just before my window I was basking himself in the sunshine and piping a few querulous notes, and a peacock was displaying all the glories of his train and strutting with the pride and gravity of a Spanish grandee on the terrace walk below. I had scarcely dressed myself when a servant appeared to invite me to family prayers. He showed me the way to a small chapel in the old wing of the house, where I found the principal part of the family already assembled in a kind of gallery furnished with cushions, hassocks, and large prayer books. The servants were treated on benches below. The old gentleman read prayers from a desk in front of the gallery, and the master Simon acted as a clerk and made the responses, and I must do him the justice to say that he acquitted himself with the great gravity and decorum. See, I'm going to take a break right here. This is the kind of thing, you know, you see the, the family sitting separately and the servant sitting separately from the family. This is the kind of thing that today people would look back and say oppression. And there's a lot of things in this that you would look back today in a presentist mindset and say oppression, but back then that's not how they would have seen it. In fact, this would have been something that would have contributed to the exaltation of the day, knowing the servants are even included. Look at this. This is something that the family this is, um, is partaking in that's uh, so important and uh, such a privilege to be partaking in. And they're letting the servants come too. That would have been the the idea uh and then we're all together here but today people would look back on that in the modern times and say well how dare there be a, a distinction between the two there should not be any distinction and it's this it's the distinction here that actually makes it special and so i just wanted to point that out this is from i come across these things all the time in all of historical literature just about you come across this stuff where you're reading it and you think, well, today that would not fly. But back then, sometimes even the things that we would think wouldn't fly are positives. Uh, and and so uh, anyway, I wanted to point that out, just a, a different time period. And, um, and uh, let's keep going. The service was followed by a Christmas carol, which Mr. Bracebridge himself had constructed from a poem as, of his favorite author, Henrik, or Heirik, 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 I think it is. And it has been adapted by an old church melody by Master Simon. As there were several good voices among the household, the effect was extremely pleasing. But I was particularly gra gratified by the exaltation of the heart and sudden sally of grateful feeling with which the worthy squire delivered one stanza, his eyes glistening and his voice rambling around of all the bounds of time and tune. "'Tis thou that crownest my glittering hearth with the guiltless mirth, and givest me wassail, bowls to drink, spice to the brink. Lord, tis thy plenty, dropping hand that soils my land, and givest me for my bushel sown twice ten for one. I afterwards understood that early morning service was read on every Sunday and Saints' Day throughout the year, either by Mr. Brain Bracebridge or by some family, a, a member of the family. It was once almost universally the case at the seats of the nobility and gentry of England, and it has 
It, it is much to be regretted that the custom is fallen into neglect, for the dullest observer must be sensible of the order and serenity prevalent in those households. Where the occasional exercise of a beautiful form of worship in the morning gives, as it were, the keynote to every temper for the day, and attunes every spirit to harmony. I want to stop there again. This, this also is interesting what he says about harmony. This is how they would have viewed the differences between people at that time as coming together to complement one another, to produce something that's harmonious. So you have the servants and you have the family and the lords and the, the clergy and you have all these different elements. They come together and they produce something so beautiful, just like a harmony uh, with a melody. Our breakfast consisted of what the squire denominated a true old English fare. He indulged in some bitter lamentations over modern breakfasts of tea and toast, which he censored as among the causes of modern effeminacy and weak nerves and the decline of old English hardiness. And though he admitted them to his table to suit the palates of his guests, yet there was a brave display of cold meats, wine, and ale on the sideboard. After breakfast, I walked about the grounds with Frank Bracebridge and Master Simon, or Mr. Simon, as he was called by everybody but the squire. We were escorted by a number of gentlemen-like dogs that seemed loungers about the establishment from the frisking spaniel to the steady old stag hound, the last of which was a race that had been in the family time out of mind. There were old obedience to a dog whistle, which hung to Master Simon's buttonhole, and in the midst of their uh, gambles, would glance an eye occasionally upon a small switch he carried in his hand. The old mansion had a still more venerable look in the yellow sunshine than by pale moonlight, and I could not but feel the force of the squire's idea that the formal terraces, heavily molded balustrades, and clipped yo, yo trees uh, carried with them an air of proud aristocracy. There appeared to be an unusual number of peacocks about the place, and I was making some remarks upon what I termed a flock of them that were basking under a sunny hall wall when I was gently corrected in my phraseology by Master Simon, who told me that according to the most ancient and approved treatise on hunting, I must say a muster of peacocks. In the same way, he added, with a slight air of pedantry, we say a flight of doves or swallows, a bevy of quails, a herd of deers, of wrens or cranes, a skulks of foxes, or a building of rooks. He went on to inform me that according to Sir Anthony Fitzherbert, we ought to ascribe to this bird both understanding and glory. For being praised, he will presently set up his tail chiefly against the sun, to the intent you may the better behold the beauty thereof. But as the fall of the leaf, the leaf, when his tail falleth, he will mourn and hide himself in corners till his tail come again, as it was. I could not help smiling at this display of small erudition on so whimsical a subject, but I found that the peacocks were birds of some consequence at the hall, for Frank Bracebridge informed me that they were great favorites with his father, who was extremely careful to keep up the breed, partly because they belonged to chivalry, and were in great request at the stately banquets of the olden time, and partly because they had a pomp and magnificence about them, highly becoming an old family mansion. Nothing he was accustomed to say had an air of greater state and dignity than a peacock perched upon an antique stone balustrade. Master Simon had now to hurry off of having an appointment at the parish church with the village choristers who were to perform some music of his selection. There was something extremely agreeable in the cheerful flow of animal spirits of the little man, and I confess I had been somewhat surprised at his apt quotations from authors who certainly were not in the range of everyday reading. I mentioned this last circumstance to Frank Bracebridge, who told me with a smile that Master Simon's whole stock of irritation was confined to some half a dozen old authors, which the squire had put into his hands, and which he read over and over whenever he had a studious fit, as he sometimes had on a rainy day or a long winter evening, Sir Anthony Fitzherbert's Book of Husbandry, Markman's Country Contentments, the Treatise of Hunting by Sir Thomas Cockaine, Knight, Isaac Walton's Angler, and two or three more such as ancient worthies of the pen were his standard authorities, and like all men who know, but a few books he looked up to them with a kind of idolatry and quoted them on all occasions. As to his songs, they were chiefly picked out of an old books in the squire's library and adapted to tunes that were popular among the choice spirits of the last century. His practical application of scraps of literature, however, has caused him to 
be looked upon as a prodigy of book knowledge by all grooms, huntsmen, and small sportsmen of the neighborhood. While we were talking, we heard the distant toll of the village bell. And I was told that the squire was a little particular in having his household at church on a Christmas morning, considering it a day of pouring out of thanks and rejoicing, for, as old Tusser observed, At Christmas be merry and thankful withal, and feast thy poor neighbors and great and the small. If you are disposed to go to church, said Frank Bracebridge, I can promise you a specimen of my cousin Simon's musical achievements. As the church is destitute of an organ, he has formed a band from the village amateurs and established a musical club for their improvement. He has also sorted a choir, and he sorted my father's pack of hounds, according to the director of Gervais Markman in his country contentments. For the bass, he has sought out all the deep solemn mouths, and for the tenor, the loud ringing mouths among the country bumpkins. And for sweet mouths, he is called with curious taste among the prettiest lasses in the neighborhood. Though these last, he affirms, are the most difficult to keep in tune. Your pretty female singer being exceedingly wayward and capricious and very liable to accidents. As the morning, though frosty, was remarkably fine and clear, the most uh, of the family walked to the church, with, which was a very old building of gray stone, and stood near a village about a half mile from the park gate. Adjourning it was a low, snug parsonage which seemed uh, covel with the church. The front of the of it was perfectly matted with a yew tree, or a yew tree. I'm not sure how you pronounce that. That had been trained against its walls. Through the dense foliage of which a apertures had been formed to admit light into small antique lat antique lattices. As we passed this sheltered nest, the parson issued forth and preceded us. I had expected to see. A sleek, well-conditioned con pastor, such as is oft found in a snug living in the vicinity of a rich patron's table, and I was disappointed. The parson was a little meager, black-looking man with a grizzled wig that was too wide and stood off from each ear, so that his head seemed to have shrunk away with it, like a dried filbert in its shell. He wore a rusty coat with its great skirts and pockets that would have held the church small Bible and prayer book, and his legs seemed still smaller from being planted in large shoes decorated with enormous buckles. I was informed by Frank Bracebridge that the parson had been a chum of his father's at or Oxford, and had received this living shortly after the latter had come to this estate. He was a complete black letter hunter, he, and would scarcely read a work printed in the Roman character. The editions of Caxton and Winken D. Word were his delight, and he was indecifiable in his researchers, researches after such an old English writers as have fallen into oblivion from their worthlessness. In deference, perhaps, to the notions of Mr. Bracebridge, he had made diligent investigations into the festive rites and holiday customs of former times and had been as zealous in the inquiry as if he had been a boon companion. But it was merely with that plodding spirit with which men of a just temperament follow up any tract of study, merely because it is denominated learning, in difference to its intrinsic nature, whether it be the illustration of the wisdom or of the ribaldry and obscenity of antiquity. He had pored over these old volumes so intensely that they seemed to have been reflected into his countenance indeed, which, if the face be an index of the mind, might be compared to a title page of black letter. On reaching the church porch, we found the parson rebuking the gray-headed sexton for having used mistletoe among the greens which the church was decorated. It was, he observed, an unholy plant profaned by having been used by the druids in their mystic ceremonies, and thought it might be in innocently employed in the festive ornamentation of halls and kitchens, yet it had been deemed by the fathers of the church as unhallowed and totally unfit for sacred purposes. So tenacious was he at this point that the poor sexton was obliged to strip down a great part of the humble trophies of his taste before the parson would consent to enter upon the service of the day. The interior of the church was venerable but simple. On the walls were several mural monuments of the brace bridges, and just behind the altar was a tomb of ancient worksmanship. There's a picture of it there on which lay the effigy of a warrior in armor, with his legs crossed, a sign of his having been a crusader. I was told it was one of the family who had been uh, signaled himself in the Holy Land, and in the same whose picture hung over the fireplace in the hall. During service, Master Simon stood up in the pew and repeated the responses very audibly, evincing the kind of ceremonious devotion punctually observed by a gentleman of the old school and a man of old family connections. I observed, too, that he turned out the leaves of a folio prayer book with something of a flourish, possibly to show off an enormous seal, uh, 
seal ring, which enriched one of his fingers, and which had the look of a family relic. But he was evidently most solicitous. <laughs> I get having trouble with some of these words. Solicitous about the musical part of the service, keeping his eye fixed intently on the choir, and beating time with much gesticulation and emphasis. The orchestra was in a small gallery, and presented a most whimsical grouping of heads piled one upon another, uh, among which I particularly noticed that of the village tailor, a pale fellow with a white retreating forehead and chin, who played on the clarinet, and seemed to have blown his face to a point. And there was another, a short Percy man, stooping and laboring at a bass viol, violin I think is what it's supposed to say, so as to show nothing but the top of a round bald head like the egg of an ostrich. There were two or three pretty faces among the female singers, to which the keen air of a frosty morning had given a bright rosy tint, but the gentlemen choristers had evidently been chosen, like old Cremona fiddles, more for tone than looks, and as several had to sing from the same book, there were clusterings of old physiognomies, uh, not unlike those groups of cherubs we sometimes see on country tombstones. The unusual service of the choir were mangled tolerably well, the vocal parts generally lagging, a little behind the instrumental, and some loitering fiddler now and then making up for the lost time by traveling over a passage which, with prodigious uh, celeb celerity, and clearing more bars than the keenest fox hunter to be in the, uh, at the death. But the great trial was an anthem that had been prepared and arranged by Master Simon and on which he had found great expectation. Unluckily, there was a blunder at the very outset. The musicians became flurried. Master Simon was in a fever. Everything went on lamely and irregularly until they came to a chorus beginning, Now let us sing with one accord, which seemed to be a signal for parting company. And all became discord and confusion. Each shifted for himself and got to the end as well, and or as rather as soon as he could, expecting one old chorister in a let's see, one old chorister in a pair of horn spectacles bestriding and pinching a long sonorous nose, who happening to stand a little apart and being wrapped up in his own melody, kept on quavering course, wriggling his head, ogling his book, and winding all up by a nasal solo of at least three bars duration. The parson gave us a most erudite sermon on the rites and ceremonies of Christmas and the propriety of observing it not merely as a day of thanksgiving, but rejoicing supporting the correctness of his opinions by the earliest passage usages of the church and enforcing them by the authorities of the Theophilus of Caesarea, St. Cyprian, St. Chrysostom, St. Augustine, and a cloud of more of saints and fathers from whom he made copious quotations. I was a little at a loss to perceive the necessity of such a mighty array of forces to maintain a point which no one present seemed inclined to dispute, but I soon found that the good man had a legion of ideal adversaries to contend with. Having in the course of his researches on the subject of Christmas got completely embroiled in the sectarian controversies of the revolution, when the Puritans had made such a fierce assault upon the ceremonies of the church, and poor old Christmas was driven out of the land by proclamation of Parliament. The worthy parson lived but with times past, and knew but a little of the present. Shut up among worm-eaten tomes in the retirement of his antiquated little study, the pages of old times were to him as the gazettes of the day, while the era of the revolution was mere modern history. He forgot that nearly two centuries had elapsed since the fiery per persecution of poor mince pie throughout the land, when plum porridge was denounced as mere popery and roast beef as anti-Christian, and that Christmas had been brought in again triumphantly with the merry court of King Charles at the Restoration. He kindled into warmth with the ardor of his contest and the host of imaginary foes with whom he had to combat, had a stubborn conflict with old Prime and two or three other forgotten champions of the Roundheads. And Roundheads would be the Puritans, just for those who don't know. On the subject of Christmas festivity, and concluded by urging his hearers in the most solemn and affecting manner to stand to the traditionary customs of their fathers and feast and make merry on this joyful anniversary of the church. I have seldom known a sermon attended apparently with more immediate effects for on leaving the church, the congregation seemed one and all possessed with the gaiety of spirit so earnestly enjoyed by their pastor. The, the elder folks gathered in knots in the churchyard, greeting and shaking hands and children ran about crying, Yule, Yule, and repeated some uncouth rhymes with which the parson who had joined us informed me that had been handed down from days of yore. The villagers doffed 
their hats to the squire as he passed giving him the good wishes of the season with every appearance of heartfelt sincerity and were invited by him to the hall to take something to keep out the cold of the weather. And I heard blessings uttered by several of the poor, which convinced me that in the midst of his enjoyments, the worthy old cavalier had not forgotten the true Christmas virtue of charity. On our way homeward, his heart seemed overflowing with generous and happy feeling. As we passed over a rising ground which commanded something of a prospect, the sounds of rustic merriment now and then reached our ears. The squire paused for a few moments and looked around with an air of an inexpressible benignity, uh, benignity. The beauty of the day was of itself sufficient to inspire philanthropy. Notwithstanding the frostiness of the morning, the sun in his cloudless journey had acquired sufficient power to melt away the thin covering of snow from every southern declivity and to bring out the living green which adorns an English landscape even in midwinter. Large tracts of smiling verdure contra uh, contrasted with the dazzling whiteness of the shaded slopes and hollows. Every sheltered bank on which the broad rays rested yielded its silver rill of cold and limpid water glittering through the drizzling grass and sent up slight exaltations to contribute to the thin haze that hung just above the surface of the earth. There was something truly cheering in this triumph of warmth and verdure uh, over the frosty thraldom of winter. It was, as the squire observed, an emblem of Christmas hospitality. Breaking through the chills of ceremony and self selfishness, thawing every heart into a flow. He poured with pleasure to the indications of the good cheer, reeking from the chimneys of the comfortable farmhouses and low-thatched cottages. I love, said he, to see this day well kept by the rich and poor. It is a great thing to have one day in the year, at least, when you are sure of being welcome wherever you go and of having, as it were, the world all thrown open to you. And I am almost disposed to join with poor Robin in his maldirection uh, maldiction of every churlish enemy to this honest festival. Those who at Christmas do repine and would fain hence dis, uh, dispatch him, may they with old Duke Humphrey dine or else may Squire catch, catch him. I'm going to just see how much longer this chapter is. It goes on for a little while here. We're going to finish it if I can find out where I was before. All right. The squire went on to lament the deplorable decay of the games and amusements which were once prevalent at this season among the lower orders and the countenance by the higher when the old halls of castles and manor houses were thrown open at daylight, when the tables were covered with brawn and beef and humming ale, when the harp and the carol resounded all day long, and when rich and poor were alike welcome to enter and make merry. Oh, our old games and local customs, said he, had a great effect in making the peasant fond of his home and the promotion of them by the gentry made him fond of his lord. They made the timeless merrier and kinder the be and better. And I can say with one of our old poets, I like them well, the curious preciseness and all pretended gravity of those that seek to banish hence these harmless sports have thrust much ancient honesty, thrust away much ancient honesty. The nation, continued he, is altered. We have almost lost our simple, true-hearted peasantry. They have broken asunder from the higher classes and seem to think their interests are separate. They have become too knowing and begin to read newspapers, listen to alehouse politicians, and talk of reform. I think one mode to keep them in good humor in these hard times would be for the nobility and gentry to pass more time on their estates. Mingle more among the country people and set the merry old English games going again. Such was the good squire's project for mitigating public discontent, and indeed, he had once attempted to put this doctrine in practice, and a few years before, had kept open house during the holidays in the old style. The country people, however, did not understand how to play their parts in the scene of hospitality. Many uncouth circumstances occurred, and the manor was overrun by all the vagrants of the country, and more beggars drawn into the neighborhood in one week than the parish officers could get rid of in a year. Since then, he had contented himself with inviting the decent part of the neighboring peasantry to call at the hall on Christmas Day and distributing beef and bread and ale among the poor, and they might make merry in their own dwellings. We had not been long home when the sound of music was heard from a distance, a band of country lads without coats, their shirt sleeves fancifully tied with ribbons, their 
hats decorated with greens and clubs in their hands were seen advancing up the avenue, followed by a large number of villagers and peasantry. They stopped before the hall door where the music struck up a peculiar air and the lads performed a curious and intricate dance, advancing, retreating, and striking their clubs together, keeping exact time to the music, while one whimsically crowned with a fox's skin, the tail of which flaunted down his back, kept capering round the skirts of the dance and rattling a Christmas box with many antic gesticulations. The squires eyed this fanciful exhibition with great interest and delight and gave me a full account of its origin, which he traced to the times when the Romans held possession of the island, plainly proving that this was a lineal descendant of the sword dance of the ancients. It was now, he said, nearly extinct, but he had accidentally met with traces of it in the neighborhood and had encouraged its revival, though, to tell the truth, it was too apt to be followed by a rough cudgel play and broken heads in the evening. After the dance was concluded, the whole party was entertained with brawn and beef and stout home brewed. The squire himself mingled upon the rustics and was received with awkward demonstrations of deference and regard. It is true, I perceived, two or three of the younger peasants, as they were raising their tankards to their mouth when the squ squire's back was turned, making something of a grimace and giving each other the wink. But the moment they caught my eye, they pulled grave faces and were exceedingly demure. With Master Simon, however, they all seemed more at ease. His varied occupations and amusements had made him well known throughout the neighborhood. He was a, a visitor at every farmhouse and cottage, gossiped with the farmers and their wives, romped with their daughters, and like that type of a vagrant bachelor, the humble bee told the sweets from all rosy lips of the countryside, country round. The bashfulness of the guests soon gave way before good cheer and affability. There is something genuine and affectionate in the gaiety of the lower orders when it is excited by the bounty and familiarity of those above them. The warm glow of gratitude enters into their mirth and a kind word or a small pleasantry frankly uttered by a patron gladdens the heart of the dependent more than oil and wine. When the squire had retired and merriment increased and there was much joking and laughter particularly between Master Simon and the hall. Uh, uh, ruddy-faced, white-headed farmer who appeared to be the wit of the village. For I observed all his co companions to wait with open mouths for his retorts and burst into a gratuitous laugh before they could well understand them. The whole house indeed seemed abandoned to merriment. As I passed to my room to dress for dinner, I heard the sound of music in a small court and looking through the window that commanded it, I perceived a band of wandering musicians with pandean pipes and tambourine, a pretty, uh, <laughs> Kotesh, uh, I think it's Kotesh, Kotish housemaid, was dancing a jig with a smart country lad while several of the other servants were looking on. In the midst of her sport, the girl caught a glimpse of my face at the window and coloring up, ran off an air of roguish affection, uh, affected confusion. All right, so <laughs> that's, uh, that's a lot there, but I wanted to read that to you. Uh, and, oh, it looks like for some reason I got decentered my uh, in the midst of that. I don't know why that happened. So you can't, let's see if I can pull this out so you can see all of it. So some of you didn't get to see all of the illustrations. I thought that I had that all set up. So what's what's the point? Why read this? Uh, well, because I like it. But um, there's some things to observe that I take away from this uh, that even you see parallels in our own times. You see the master of the house complaining about uh, how men aren't men anymore because they don't eat a good breakfast. I, th this kind of, I see this parallel to the soy boys thing today, right? Uh, you see the way in which uh, the lower classes who were now listening to political rhetoric that was uh, making them feel like they're, they were being uh, oppressed and that their interests weren't represented in the higher classes who had the responsibility of taking care of them in, in a certain way. That was the land arrangement at the time. Uh, you see there's a discontentment and that Christmas is a time when that discontentment goes away. But unfortunately, the traditions uh, had already been eroded. The traditions of the peasantry understanding how to show respect when they're invited into the hall of the, uh, the, the, the Lord in the area, uh, the master. And, and so the social bonds are starting to break down. And Christmas though is a time when they're strengthened. And 
and, and there's charity uh, that's expressed between all. The people that have money and have land, they're giving of what they have to those around them. Uh, there's, um, there's games and merriment, and so they, people are actually participating with one another and rubbing shoulders with each other and laughing with each other. And they're also participating in uh, a, a liturgy together. They're going to church. And there's even mistakes at church. And there's peculiar things at church. I mean, this is a very rooted thing. It's very particular to local customs, to, to a place, to a people, real people, not abstractions. But this is, this is a real place. These are real people, real descriptions of them. And you start loving them. You start valuing them. You start assessing them based on who they are and not on what social class they come from or something like that. And so um, that's, I think, that's part of what we're missing. And in my mind, the application is, it, obviously, during Christmas time, we still have some of these traditions. Charity, giving to others, um, donating uh, of time and money, giving to those who are, who are in need. I, I sense that, you know, these are things that we need to continue. Uh, not just giving gifts to family, but participating in charity to those around us. Opening our homes uh, to those that we can open them to and uh, letting them participate in the bounty God's given us. Uh, th these were things that were part of the celebration of Christ's coming and his birth. And those are some of the things that uh, I, I see even as I go to the mall. I went to the mall the other day. I try to avoid it. It's been months since I've been at the mall, but I went to the mall. And you could hardly tell it was Christmas. Um, we're losing some things. We are losing our traditions. We are losing some of our carols. And, and keep them alive. Keep them alive in your home and in your neighborhood, in your neck of the woods. Do what you can to keep these good, valuable things still going. And uh, I'm inspired by these kinds of stories uh, to know that th there, there is something. There was something. There's something tangible that we are passing down, that we're continuing. So there you go. There's, there's uh, my reading of two essays that are from the book Old Christmas. I'd encourage you to get the book, read the whole thing, maybe make it a tradition every year like I do. And, uh, well, one last thing. I don't know if I mentioned it. Uh, this is the book, actually one of the books, that inspired the Christmas Carol. You may have heard of that book. And there's, of course, the, all the different movie renditions of Ebenezer Scrooge. Charles Dickens was inspired by this particular story as well, apparently. So a uh, little fun fact there. So anyway, have a Merry Christmas with your family, wherever you are. And I pray that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is the center of that, that uh, all the things that surround it, many of them I just read about, uh, that those are so good and important and good to pass down, but they're all, honestly, they, they need to be rooted in some, an anchor. And that anchor is that Jesus came. And that's why all of the good things that we enjoy and things that have developed over time uh, are are actually worthwhile and good. It's because that's the centerfold of all of it, that Jesus came into this world, God became a man. And, and you want to talk about the Lord opening up his home to the peasants. And this is, I mean, Jesus, the God of the universe, uh, entered this place, this dark place, and he brought light and, of course, made a way that we could be forgiven of our sins and in a right relationship with the Father. And that's what we celebrate more than anything, uh, that the Lord of the universe has led us, the peasants, uh, and those who have wronged him greatly even, to come in and sit at his table and partake in his blessings. God bless. Merry Christmas.